Good morning, all of you. Good morning to all dear participants and on the part of uh, our seminar, uh, day two. Um, two days online training program on pursuing food security in adverts of acute pandemic. Faculty of Food and Agriculture. And uh, he's going to tell you the day two lecture, um, the topic on uh, resilient food system in the adverse of climate change. Uh, all the participants, I request you to connect with the Zoom. If it is not possible to connect, if you have any network problem, um, you can join through this YouTube link. Thank you. Uh, now I request, uh, our professor, uh, Dr. T. Sarvana Kumar, to deliver to lecture. Hello. Hi, pleasant good morning, everyone. Do you hear me well?
Hello. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Raja sir. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. I can hear. Okay, because um, I'm right. getting some uh, feedback. Shall I start? Yes, you can start. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, pleasant morning everyone. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to be here to present this uh, topic, Pursuing for Security in the Adverse of Chronic Climate Change. Yesterday, we had a talk as well as presentation on the Pursuing for Security in the Adverse of Acute Pandemic. And today, we are going to see about how we could chase or follow or accomplish food security in the adverse of chronic climate change. So today we are going to talk and we are going to see more about the impacts of the climate change as well as resilient food systems. How can we build resilient food systems, which are very much important considering the global population, the other challenges that are affecting the food security. My name is Dorai Sami Sarvana Kumar. I'm a professor at the Department of Food Production, University of the West Indies, St. Austin Campus, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, here, I would have given some introduction about our uh, campus. Uh, so directly, I will go to the presentation. When we talk about climate change, the first thing comes to everyone. Is it real? Does it really exist? A lot of people think the climate change is not a real thing or it is not existing and it is not occurring. Whenever we say climate change, there is always ambiguity, suspicion and debate. But we researchers, we always rely on observations, facts and the facts. Here we are going to see some of the facts which say the climate change is on and it is real and it is existing for several years. So to see that we have to check based on the observations, based on the data that we have collected over the years. Then we will going to we, we are going to see how this climate change will impact the food security. Then we are going to see what are the resilient food systems that we can develop or that we have already to mitigate or to adapt this climate change issues. In this regard, if you see the climate change facts, over the years, they have recorded temperature. Here, from 2011 to 2020, and that is actually recorded as the hottest decade of the 170 year series. If you see here, 2016 was regarded as the hottest year, followed by 2019, followed by 2015, 2017, and 2018. Here again, we have to understand that how this is regarded as the hottest year. If you see the industrialization, the period which started industrialization, from that, the temperature has been 
baseline as zero. So from that, the increase in the temperature has been recorded or as it has been considered to see how the temperature increases on over the years. Here, if you see the pre-industrial baseline, that is from 1881 to 1910, and that was considered as zero. And from that, how the temperature is increasing every year. Here, if you see, in 2019 and 2016, the temperature, it has raised above that baseline level, and it reached 1.2 to 1.5. That's really the high level. That's why this particular decade is considered as the hottest decade in 180 year series. Also, there are several international organizations. They were recording the temperature over the years, both surface temperature as well as the sea surface temperature. Here, if you see the surface temperature, based on the low emissions as well as the high emission scenario, what will happen if we are not going to control the emissions of the carbon dioxide or the greenhouse gases, the temperature increase will be on and on. Here, in case of projected low emissions, the temperature can be maintained with one degree Celsius increase at the end of this century. But at the same time, if you see, if you are not going to control the emissions of the gases, greenhouse gases, then it is expected to reach four degrees Celsius, which is very high. Similarly, the sea surface temperature here, again, the sea surface temperature, it can be contained below one degree Celsius. If you are going to follow the protocols as well as going to keep low emissions of the greenhouse gases. But at the same time, if you're not going to keep the emission of greenhouse, greenhouse gases, and if it reaches higher level, then ultimately the sea surface temperature will also be increased. So this is the data recorded by the IPCC Ocean and Cryosphere Special Report. And this report says that ocean and air temperatures are rising every year. So this is another fact which states that the temperature increase is a real thing. The next important contributor of the climate change, elevated levels of carbon dioxide. The elevated levels of carbon dioxide have been recorded from so many years. From 1955 to till 2020, if you see, the level of carbon dioxide has increased from 320 parts per million to 414 parts per million. This indicates that every year, the emission of carbon dioxide is there, which leads to the emission of greenhouse gases, or which is part of the greenhouse gases, then it leads to the climate change. This also shows that the climate change is real and it is on. Then the next thing, the data says that by the end of 21st century, because of the emission of greenhouse gases, the temperature is going to increase, both S temperature as well as the sea surface temperature. When the sea surface temperature is going to increase, then naturally the sea levels will rise due to the ice cap melting. When this happens, it is estimated that the sea levels will rise to 1.1 meters above present levels. This is again from the interpanel governmental Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, according to 2019 reports. Again, here we could realize that the climate change is on and it is real. Then the heat wave, not only the heat wave, but also droughts and floods. They are considered or they are called as the extreme events. So these extreme weather conditions or these extreme events, they have become more frequent and intense. In 2018, the climate disasters, it directly affected nearly 30 million people and caused several thousand deaths. We would have heard about a lot of flooding 
across countries, across the world, in Mumbai, in Chennai, in Nod, as well as in some of the American countries and in European countries. So this kind of rapidly intensifying hurricanes or monster hurricanes, so they're all considered as the result of change in climate. Here you could see in North India, the highest temperature is recorded. So it, it indicates that the climate change is real. So with all this climate change is happening, and now we, we convince that, okay, the climate change is on and it is real. So what are we going to do? What are the global organizations or what are the countries doing? Based on all these changes are happening, the United Nations, they brought all countries together and they built upon the convention of all nations to combat climate change through Paris Agreement. And this Paris Agreement, it aimed to strengthen the global response to keep below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels before the end of this century. Then again, to pursue efforts to limit temperature increase even further to 1.5 degrees Celsius. They wanted to keep it below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Only then we may be able to attempt to keep the temperature below two degrees Celsius. As I told you then again, the pre-industrial period is considered between 1850 to 1900. Then after that only the industrialization of countries have started, then the emission of greenhouse gases occurred, which led to the climate change. And here, based on this Paris Agreement and all countries, almost 196 countries, they have signed in this convention and they have committed to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases and committed to keep the temperature below 1.5 degrees Celsius and to the maximum extent of 2 degrees Celsius before the end of this century. So all these things are happening. And now we know that, okay, this is about the climate change, increase in the temperature, elevated carbon dioxide, rise in sea level, extreme weather events like flooding, drought, and heat waves. All these things are happening. So what does it mean for agriculture and food security? Is it going to impact agriculture? If it is going to impact agriculture, in what way they are going to impact agriculture? Here, if you see increase in temperature, do you know that the crops we grow, it always, it has some specific temperatures to grow. We have temperate crops, we have subtropical crops, and we have tropical crops. Then again, they are based on the rainfall and based on the temperature. Some crops, they pollinate and the pollen viability will be very specific to the temperatures. And some of them will reproduce only at specific temperature conditions. So in such instances, it, it is definitely going to have the impact on crop cultivation and agriculture, which naturally leads to the food security. Then elevated levels of carbon dioxide. How is it going to impact agriculture and food security? The elevated levels of carbon dioxide, it is good for agriculture because we all have studied about the photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes place in the presence of carbon dioxide. So when carbon dioxide exists more and more, then it is good for crop growth so that we will be able to harvest more and more. So we should be happy, but still we are saying that it may have some negative impact on agriculture and food security. Also rise in sea level, how that is going to impact agriculture and extreme weather conditions. Of course, we are going to see how they are going to impact agriculture. So first, how does the change in temperature impact crop production? As I told you that the temperature is increasing Every year it is increasing. So in such instances, what will happen to the crop production? Are we going to face any decline or reduction in crop production? Based on the data from the consultative group on international agricultural research, there's a research program on climate change, agriculture and food security. They 
reported that for every one degree Celsius increase in temperature, there is going to be a 5% decrease in crop productivity. This says that there is going to be a serious impact on food security. And here, the researchers in 2017, they have used a different model systems to predict the impact of temperature increase on major staple food crops. We know that wheat, rice, maize, and soybean, they are the major staple crops, carbohydrate crops, especially wheat, rice, and maize. If we see the global civilization, Asian civilization, we know that it is started with rice cultivation. And European civilization, it banks on wheat cultivation. And American civilization, it banks on maize. So that's why the cultivation of these major and stable food crops is very important for food security. Based on using different models like grid simulation model and point simulation models and point observation, the authors have predicted what will be the impact of temperature increase on these crops? And here they have predicted that for every one degree Celsius increase in temperature in wheat, there is going to be 6% reduction in yield. In rice, there is going to be 3% reduction. And in maize, it is going to be 7.4% reduction. And in soybean, it's going to be 3.1% reduction. And also the authors have done some excellent work on it to see in which part the impact is going to happen. And based on their predictions and based on their models, because the climate change and its impact on agriculture, the, it, it can be model and can be predicted based on the historical data as well as based on the buildup of the models. And here they have predicted in case of wheat the impact is going to be more in Russia and India. In Russia, the impact will be 7% reduction in yield, and in India, it is going to be 9% reduction in yield, followed by United States and France. And here again, we know that Russia, it is again, it is in the top, and India, it is actually subtropical, but whereas in case of France and United States, is going to be there with the cooler, temperatures than India. So the one degree Celsius increase in temperature that may not have much impact on wheat cultivation. But whereas in case of India and Russia, it may be a different scenario. In case of rice, they have predicted that in, in India, there will be 6% yield reduction. In case of maize, it was predicted in United States and in China, the yield reduction would be around 10% and 8% respectively, followed by Brazil and India, which they predict that it could be a 5% reduction in yield. In case of soybean, if you see per degree increase in the temperature, the soybean yield it may be 7% reduced in the United States. So now we have seen the impact of temperature and the, the production, how that will impact the stable food crops. As I told you, some of the countries, those who are producing all these foods and they may be self-reliant despite some of these reductions. But at the same time, we have to think about the vulnerable communities. Most of these countries, they are self-reliant on food production. But at the same time, when they are going to market it and when they are going to export it, are the countries, those who are depending on these countries for these food imports, then it's going to affect. And here, for instance, in case of small island developing states like the Caribbean islands. And here, these islands, they depend on other countries for the staple food. In such instances, then again, it is going to affect the food security of the vulnerable communities or the vulnerable countries or the vulnerable region. 
Okay, that's what in the Caribbean only Haiti and Belize, they produce more than 50% of what they consume and others fully depend on food importation. So in that case, they fully depend on the staple food producing countries. So these are all some of the challenges with respect to increase in temperature. Then the next thing is, when there is an increase in the temperature, the risk will be very high in rain fed agriculture. And it was predicted that, suppose if the temperature increased to four degrees Celsius, than the pre-industrial level, then the rain crop, rain fed crop production is going to be in high risk in some of the African countries. Also, we know that in India also, almost 50% of the uh, net areas shown, it comes under the rain fed agriculture. So it may have some negative impact on rain fed agriculture. In addition to that, it, as I told you that the pollination or the pollen viability or the reproduction, everything, it depends on the temperature and relative humidity and moisture. So in such instances, if the temperature is going to increase to an unprecedented levels, like four degrees Celsius from the free industrial levels, then definitely it is going to affect crops like common beans, which will no longer be viable. So that's why it's very much important to know what is the impact of this temperature increase. Also, not only the crop production, but also the livestock production could be impacted due to increase in temperature. From study conducted in 2001, they, they have identified there is a risk in livestock production due to increase in temperature. For instance, when two degrees Celsius increase in temperature and during that simulated conditions, it favored the spread and the infection of blue tongue virus in sheep. And not only that, the livestock production, it could be hampered with increased temperature due to heat stress. The heat stress, it leads to a lot of problems with the animals. And one, it could be the loss of digestion and the reduction in the milk production. The health of the animal is also affected because of heat stress. So this could be the impacts on the livestock production. In addition to the livestock production, the seafood systems, they also at risk due to temperature increase because the food security, it is to ensure the healthy, safe and nutritious enough food for all through crop production, animal production and seafood systems. So it is the systematic approach to supply enough and healthy food for all. So it is not only limited with the crop production. Other than crop production, the animal production and seafood systems, they also contribute to the food security. So in such instances, the temperature, it has impact on crop production, animal production and tropical ecosystems, tropical marine ecosystems and sea ecosystems and seafood systems. Here, for instance, if you see here, the tropical countries, they, they are going to have a high risk because of increase in temperature. Due to this, there will be a disturbance in the sea so that uh, the sea temperature can also be affected so that the sea resources or the fish stock, it could be moved from this to another regions. Here, one of the examples, due to increase in temperature at sea, and here, Black Sea boss, uh, it was once abandoned in North Carolina, and it have moved to New England, which is cooler region. And the next one is tropical rapid fish. It moved from this tropical region to Mediterranean. Then again, this one, is the hotter region and here is the cooler sea. Then 
there is a possibility that the migration of salmon and tuna from tropics to Arctic, if the temperature is going to increase, this will highly impact the local communities or the fishermen who fully are highly dependent on sea stock as well as the marine stock for their livelihood. So in such instances that will hamper their economic situations as well as their livelihood, which again threaten their affordability and access to the food security. In addition to the impact on tropical marine ecosystems, the temperature, it may have impact on the outbreak of pests and diseases. Over the years, we would have seen that there are some minor diseases and some time later it would have become major diseases or major pest problems. While we study the diseases, we would have studied the disease triangle. And in this triangle, we know that the host, the plant, it should be susceptible and the pathogen, it must be virulent and the environmental conditions, it should be favorable. Only then the disease occurrence will be there. And here we talk about environmental conditions like temperature, relative humidity, and the other factors. So in such instances, the disease incidence could be increased, which may result in the outbreak of pests and diseases. For instance, here, outbreak of rucose spiraling white fly in coconut. This is actually uh, correlated or it is actually interpreted that the occurrence was noticed or it would be high, the outbreak, due to drop in humidity, due to monsoon deficit, as well as increase in some summer temperature above two degrees Celsius. And this is now some, some time ago, the, the, this was a problem in Southern India on coconut plantations. Similarly, there are several outbreak of pests and diseases occurring across countries due to change in temperature, due to change in the climate factors. Apart from this, we would have heard about this locust swamps. The locust, which actually breed and which is restricted in the region of the Africa, that is the Eastern Africa. But over the time, it has moved from the desert area, that is from the Horn of Africa, and it is moving to the Arabian countries, and it is actually moving to Asian countries. We would have read all this information in the news as well as in the media. So this indicates that there is a climate change, and that is attributing to the movement of these local swarms. There are two factors the researchers have identified and they are actually interpreting that. That could have been the reason for the movement of these locust swamps from Africa to Asian countries. One is they are saying that the high rainfall within the short period, that is above 400% during October to December 2019, the Saharan area or else the uh, African countries, they received that much of rainfall, which assisted in breeding of the locusts. And also before that, there was high temperature and the temperature as well as the rainfall and both of these factors, they have contributed to the migration or movement of the locust swamps leaving African deserts. Then again, why that particular region has got highest rainfall during or, or over the normal or average rainfall, I told you that 400% above normal within the short period of time, what would have been the reason for that? And here they attribute that the Indian Ocean and it has the dipole and because of this the dipole effect, here in the western Indian Ocean, it heats up more than the Eastern Indian Ocean. And because of this warming effect, what happens in this region, the sea water, it evaporate, and then the sea is actually warmer. And because of this warmer sea, there is more evaporation 
and because of more evaporation of water then it leads to high rainfall which leads to flooding and also assisting the breeding of locust swamps but on this side what happens the eastern side of the ocean indian ocean and here this is actually cooler than normal sea temperatures and because of the cooler condition here there is less rain which leads to high drought or else the high temperature and this hotness was recorded or else noticed in australia and it also leads to extreme fire conditions so these are all actually related to the climate change actions in addition to outbreak of pests and diseases due to temperature now we will see what are the impacts of elevated co2 levels because we have seen that the climate change and it could be because of increase in temperature or elevated co2 levels or rise in sea levels and also due to the extreme weather conditions here in case of elevated co2 levels as i told you that the elevated co2 level is very good for crop growth then what would be the problem the problem predicted or the problem analyzed due to elevated co2 levels it is noted that the crops will have poor nutritional quality by 2015 175 million more people will be having zinc deficient deficiency 122 million people will be protein deficient and it is predicted that 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 will happen in asia and africa according to the report from the climate change agriculture and food safety report so it would security report also the researchers in 2018 they published a data and they have analyzed and and they 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 predicted as well in rice and wheat because of the elevated levels of the carbon dioxide the crop growth will be more but at the same time there will be a less concentration or poor quality of proteins micronutrients and vitamins b because of this the persons may have high vulnerability and susceptibility to infectious diseases diarrhea and anemia so this is one of the major problems with respect to elevated co2 levels in addition to that the rise in sea levels so what is the problem because of this here again the salt water it can push into the inland so that the soils may become more saline because of this salinity the production and productivity it it can be hampered not only that the water quality may also be affected then salinity it may become a serious problem in food security then the next thing extreme weather conditions rapidly intensifying monster hurricanes it could devastate agricultural production no matter what type of crop we have we may have the annuals or we may have the crops like horticultural trees or forest trees and it may have severe impact due to this monster hurricanes we have experienced this across the countries for instance here in caribbean island grenada it it had a severe hurricane in 2004 and because of this hurricane it's surplus of 17 million dollar it has been turned into deficit of 54 million dollar and in 2017 due to hurricane season in dominica and antigua and barbuda there was a huge loss to agriculture you could see the the plantations or the plants banana trees just before harvest and they all fell and it it caused huge loss so it is not only in the caribbean islands or in in other parts of the world the same thing has been noticed in india as well though it is not a island it is a peninsula countries and here bartha oki and gajab cyclones and they have been 
recorded in 2016, 2017, and 2018. Of this, in 2018, due to this gacha, 10 million coconut trees, they were uprooted. Then you can just imagine the wind velocity or the strength of the winds or the hurricanes or the cyclones. The coconut plant plantations, they were highly uprooted. So this has caused a huge loss to agriculture. This is not just a one day investment or one day tree. This is about like 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. So in such instances, these extreme weather conditions, it is, it is interpreted due to the changes in climate. Now, we, we can see how this climate change is impacting agriculture. But at the same time, the same agriculture is contributing to climate change as well. So that is the connection between climate change, agriculture, and food security. Because the climate change, it is not only impacting the agriculture, but agriculture is also contributing to the climate change. We cannot safely say that we do not contribute anything to the climate change. It is only the industrial people. It is only the vehicles. It is only the industry that are making automobiles or the automobiles on the road. They only contribute to this climate change through emission of greenhouse gases. And we cannot safely say that because agriculture, it contributes significantly to the climate change. Let us see how, how it contributes to climate change. Here, deforestation, which is considered as a serious issue. Because of this the deforestation, there will be loss in carbon sequestration. And so that there is a um, emission which leads to the climate change. And again, you may ask, why do we need uh, to go for deforestation? Because deforestation is not only for the industrial construction or for making some infrastructure facilities, but people also do deforestation for cultivation to utilize them as the agricultural lands. So in such instances, it can contribute to the climate change. The data says that between 2000 and 2010, agriculture, the, the land for cultivation, it destroyed 80% of the deforestation worldwide. So from this, we can understand, okay, we are also contributing to the climate change. And not only that, the data says that the global greenhouse gas emissions, 26% is coming from the food systems and 74% is coming from the non-food systems. Then again, you know what is a food system? Food system is a complex web of activities involving production, processing, transport, and consumption. Here, if you see the land use, land use for livestock, land use for human food, they actually contribute 24% within that 26%. And here, crops for human food and the crop production, because the crops is not only for the human food, but also we produce it for animal feed. So in such cases, the crop production, it totally accounted for 27% of greenhouse gas emission within the food systems. Then livestock and fisheries, they contribute 31% of greenhouse gases within the food systems. And within the food systems, it is not only about the production, but also it is about the supply chain, like food processing, transport and packaging and retail. So all these activities along the supply chain they contribute 18% to the food systems. So from this, we can realize that the food systems it contribute significantly to the emission of greenhouse gases. 
So now we understand that the agriculture, it contributes to the climate change. So we are blaming climate change because it is impacting agriculture. But at the same time, the agriculture is also contributing to the climate change. So we need strategies on both sides. We need to see how the agriculture, it can less contribute to the climate change or it can reduce its contribution to the climate change. And at the same time, how this climate change will not impact agriculture. So we have to redesign the agricultural activities in such a way so that we will not have the full impact of climate change on food security and food production and food systems. So for this, we have to develop the climate resilience or climate smart agriculture or sustainable agricultural practices. There are so many fancy names have been developed over the years. Whatever the sustainable activities that we carry out in agriculture and to in response to the climate actions or in response to the climate changes, then we, we call them as the climate resilience or climate smart agriculture. So through developing these climate resilient strategies or climate smart agriculture, we will be able to withstand against the climate change. And still we will be able to produce the same amount of food that we need to supply and feed everyone. So for that, we need adaptation strategies. So now we have to think about how we can reduce the contribution to climate change. And here in this one, we have to reduce through sustainability. Then again, we have to develop the sustainable practices so that we will not contribute much to the climate change. So how we can achieve this? Then again, using the mitigation strategies. So now we have the option of adaptation strategies and mitigation strategies. Through this adaptation strategies and mitigation strategies, we will be able to develop the sustainable practices and we will be able to develop the climate resilience and climate smart agricultural practices. So we will see what are those practices. First, we will see adaptation strategies. Then we will see some of the mitigation strategies. Adaptation strategies. When it comes to crop production, we know that we have a lot of land races, the indigenous species and the indigenous cultivars. So we have to make use of those genetic resources and we have to conserve those things and we have to make use of that to develop resilience as well as to adapt to the changes in the temperature or to the elevated levels of the CO2 or to the salinity or to the flooding. So we have to make use of these genetic resources, which is the key for developing any adaptation strategy in case of crop production. Because we have to see that there is an increase in the yield and breeding of crops for climate resilience. Then again, in this case, if you see, for instance, it is not that we develop a single plant to address one particular problem because the climate change, it is the compounding issue and it could occur at any time because it's, it's a kind of uncertainty. So in such instances, we have to develop the plant which can withstand against all odds and challenges of the climate change. And in this case, the authors, they permit or else they have identified the QTLs which can offer tolerance against drought, salinity, and flooding in dries. And they have identified the QTLs from the different sources, and they have actually introduced into the popular variety, and they have identified through market-assisted breeding programs. So that's why I said we have to conserve the genetic resources, and we have to make use of those genetic resources to build resilience, as well as to develop adaptation strategies so that the, the plant, it can withstand against all odds and challenges of the climate change. It is not that we can say, I developed 
a particular variety against the drought. Suppose if we flood occurs due to the uncertainty, that's what I'm saying. Uh, the climate, it is in, it is an uncertain and drought, and all of a sudden you may get rain within short period of time, which may be the historic one. In such instances, the drought resistant, it may not be standing flooding. So that's why we have to think the strategies as a holistic way to fight against this climate change. Here, the authors, that's from uh, TNAU, and they have done research. And here, of 12 days of submergence of flooding, here you could see this is actually the parent and it cannot withstand. But whereas the other ones, which has been introduced with the QTLs, and they were able to withstand even after 12 days of submergence. And it indicates that it, it can withstand. Also, develop resistance against pests and diseases. And here in Guyana, what we have done, we have identified the blast resistance through some proteomics walks, uh, a proteomics approach, as well as through regular screening programs. And here we have identified this FL 12127, and this showed a strong and high resistance against the blast. So this could be a very good source for developing the resistant lines, as well as here, we have used a statistical method, uh, as well as the analytical method to uh, identify the elite line, which can withstand against wide uh, range of environmental stress conditions, that is, uh, the, the conditions that have different temperatures and relative humidity. So the genetically stable lines can be identified against pests and diseases using the analytical approaches. And in this way we have identified, so this could be one of the uh, adaptation strategies against pests and disease. Not only the breeding techniques, but also the host resistance, it can be developed through grafting technique as well. If you see in the tropical conditions, the bacterial wilt, which is caused by Ralstonia solanaceorum, is a serious problem in tomato. In an island called St. Lucia, the, the crop is completely devastated due to this disease and it favors the high, uh, uh, high temperature and uh, the tropical conditions. Even the application of any, any uh, chemicals or anything, it, it never controls this one. So here, what we have done, we have used the uh, resistant rootstock from the wild type plant, which is known as the Solanum Torvo. And we have used that plant as the rootstock and over that rootstock, we have grafted the tomato seedlings. Then it has been tested in uh, glasshouse conditions as well as in the field conditions. And that uh, rootstock, it has resistance against the nematode as well as the bacteria and because of that, it, it, it was able to withstand in the glasshouse house where it was heavily infected with the bacterial wilt pathogen. And here you could see the uh, results. This is the treatment of grafted seedlings. They, they, were, they, they withstand against the pathogen inoculation and against the disease. But whereas here, in case of control, that is non-grafted seedlings, all seedlings, they died. So not only the breeding strategies, but as you're all horticultural people from the College of Horticulture, you could also think of grafting the fruits uh, as well as the vegetables on the resistant rootstocks so that we will be able to withstand against the odds and challenges caused by pests and diseases. Also, we have some of the climate smart agriculture techniques like vertical farming is becoming very popular so that we will be able to contain and control the conditions, the temperature and other strategies and we could utilize or reduce the space and we will be able to cultivate the crops and harvest for, for security. As well as here in such instances, here what happens, we could also reduce the use of the chemicals. 
also protected farming is also seen as one of the climate smart agricultural practices. It has its own advantages and disadvantages, but still the protected farming in a uh, place where the climate uncertainty is a, a serious uh, issue. So to adapt to that climate change conditions, we, we can uh, employ and we can adapt to these protected farming conditions. Then sustainable soil and water management to adapt to the water scarcity. Here what happens, the, 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 there is a um, water withdrawal across all countries and in some countries there is uh, the water scarcity index is very high. The groundwater withdrawal is uh, more and more so that uh, it, it, it becomes very serious threat for rainfed agriculture as well as for the irrigated agriculture. And here what happens in case of sustainable soil and water management practices, we could use some of the techniques like drip irrigation um, to save water. So these are all some of the adaptation strategies which can be employed, I think, to withstand against the climate change. With that, we have seen some of the adaptation strategies. Then we will see what are the mitigation strategies that we can try to address the climate change as well as to reduce the contribution to the climate change. As I told you that the deforestation is a uh, issue that is actually causing contribution to climate change. So in that case, the agroforestry systems, it can very well reduce the emission of greenhouse gases and increased carbon sequestration capacity. And we could think of a lot of silviculture practices and agroforestry systems. In such a way, we could mitigate the climate change as well as we can reduce the contribution of greenhouse gas emission to the climate change. Also microbial solutions for biotic and abiotic stresses. Microorganisms, they really have a lot of potential to facilitate the sustainable growth and cultivation of crops for growth promotion and to withstand against the stress conditions, both biotic and abiotic stress conditions. And here, our work is more on the biologicals and we have developed this bioformulation against the management of uh, diseases in uh, vegetable crops. There are some specific microorganisms which can facilitate the crop to withstand against abiotic stresses like salinity. Because the plant physiology, it can be interacted and it can be uh, slight, it can be modified with the interaction of plant microbe associations. There are plant growth promoting microorganisms which can help the plant to withstand against adverse conditions as well as it can be a sustainable practice. This will actually reduce the application of pesticides. Then again, the application of the pesticides, then application of the uh, fertilizers, they also, contribution, they, they also contribute to the climate change. So in such instances, the microbial solutions, and they, they, they are very good for mitigating uh, the strategies of uh, mitigating climate change impacts. Then of course, develop and employ sustainable soil and pest management practices for production of the safe food systems. Also integration of advanced techniques like remote sensing, GIS and the drone technology. Also to get advice on the forecast warning so that the farmers they can now take up the relevant practices or else the agricultural uh, practices in the field to avoid the contribution to the climate change. Here, if you see some of the food systems, how the mitigation strategies can be designed or tailored to reduce the contribution to climate change from agriculture. Some 
can be done within the research institutions or with, within the research point of view or within the production aspects. But at the same time, if you see the food systems, it is not only restricted or limited to the produ production, but also it goes beyond that production. It is the processing and it is the transport and it is the consumption. So when we think about the resilient food systems, then we cannot just stop with production aspects of crops or animals or seafood systems. But also we have to think about the other chains or other blocks of the food systems. And some of the things it can be tailored or it, it can be facilitated by the research institutions like what I have presented so far, like the breeding of crops, the development of disease resistant crops, and also developing some of the microbial solutions to mitigate the climate change as well as to uh, reduce the contribution to climate change from agricultural field, from ag agricultural, uh, inter agricultural activities. But some of them, it cannot be done with the research institutions. It has to be done by the policymakers as well as by the governments, as well as by the uh, uh, national and international organizations. So in such cases, um, ensure zero agricultural land expansion on high carbon landscapes. For instance, the uh, data uh, uh, from WWF and the uh indicated that 11 deforestation fronts with projected losses from 2010 to 2030. And they have identified and uh, they, they are like the reservoirs and if they are going to have any devastation or else the destruction of these lands for converting that to, into any of the agricultural land, then there, there will be contribution to the climate change. For instance, here, this region, especially the Southern America, South America, and here if you see Amazon, and this is a strong reservoir for carbon sequestration and uh, carbon trading. If this portion is destroyed or for, for any of the agricultural purposes, then the contribution to climate change will be high. And similarly, they have identified some other places in the Africa as well as in some of the Asian countries and in Australia. So the policymakers at national levels or at uh, international level, and they have to ensure that there will be a zero agricultural land expansion on high carbon landscapes. And as I told you that, it is not only with production and transport and processing, but also it is with the consumption. And regarding consumption, consumption can also mitigate the climate change contributions. If you see the food loss waste the food loss waste, if you are going to reduce the food loss and food waste, then it can reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide. Similarly, the global food system under current diets, and it contributes to seven gigatons of carbon dioxide emission per year. And here it is interesting to note that the emission of carbon dioxide when people eat more of meat buffalo meat or the other livestock meat the consumption or the emission of carbon dioxide is high because the livestock they emit higher greenhouse gases like methane and they contribute high to the climate change so in such cases if the diet is changed, then in that case, in the in, in 2030, it is predicted that we could reduce at least 25% of the emission of greenhouse gases, that is especially carbon dioxide here. Also, if you see farm and grassland production, when we change the diet, then there will be less requirement of this grass or forage for the animals. In such instances, then again, we could reduce the emission of carbon dioxide. And also when we conserve the forest, 
then there is a complete save on the emission of the carbon dioxide. So the diet, it, it play a major role. There are some movements and there are some activities happening across the world. In, in, in Colombia, they have a moment and they have an activity called Meatless Monday. In the sense, they have a moment and they have communicated to all restaurants and all uh, persons responsible and they will not have meat served on Mondays of every week. So by that way, they reduce and they change the diets. So this is a one, one way of resilient food systems mitigating the climate change contributions. So that's why changing diets, reducing food loss and waste, and also enable markets and public sector actors to incentivize climate resilient and low emission practices. Here, the data shows that in case of greenhouse gas emissions for 100 gram of protein, we all know that the livestock it, it supplement high sources of protein. But at the same time, the carbon dioxide emissions per serving. And here if you see in case of meat, the emission of carbon dioxide is high. But whereas in case of plant-based proteins, the emission of carbon dioxide is less. So in such cases, the diet, it can also contribute to the climate change. So along the value chains, we have to think about, that's why we, we, we see about the resilient food systems. The data, interestingly, here you could see that again, India is at the safest place. This is the per capita meat consumption data from 2013, and here, the data shows that the persons eating meat from 0 to 10 kg per person and 10 to 20, 20 to 40, and it goes up to 100 to 120 kg per person. And here, if you see this bright red, I mean, sorry, dark red, they consume more meat. But whereas here, the African as well as some of the Asian countries, as well as here, if you see India, and it, it, it is between um, zero to 10 kg per person. So it's already is, uh, working well in, in uh, countries like India, but well, when, when you see the other countries, the consumption of meat is high so that the production or emission of carbon dioxide is more. And here you see the beef production, it contributes 2.9, gigatons of carbon dioxide emission per year and which is actually 41 percent of total agricultural emissions so the resilient food system here suggested with plant-based meat alternatives also per capita milk consumption milk consumption is also high in other countries when compared to asian countries like china and india so this dairy then again it comes from the livestock and it contributes about 1.4 gigatons of carbon dioxide emission per year, or which is equivalent to 20% contribution to the agricultural emissions. So the change in diet, it can very well reduce the contribution of agricultural sector to the climate change. By that way, the resilient food systems was suggested. Then climate resilient agriculture and food systems overall, we have to realign policies and finance and support to social movements and innovation at nation, national and regional level. Because what happens? We often view the problem, the technical people, we always say whether it is the success or it is the failure. We will not think beyond that. Most of the times, we do research and we see, okay, we get the success in this experiment and how the technology is success. Our breeding program is success. We have a variety, we have a technology. Or otherwise we do research and we see, okay, we end up with failure. Then again, we will think about the next experiment and we will go. 
But at the same time, when we think about policies, it is not in our hand, it is beyond our hand, and it is with the policy makers. Because they have to lend the finance and support to the social movements and the other supporting activities. In such instances, the policy makers often view the same problem with different dimensions. They may have the electoral issues and they will think whether the people will vote for that activity or not. So the 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 policies it has to convince the policymakers as well, and they have to make their own contribution and responsibility to see and keep these moments going. So it is the responsibility of all persons, the civil society and countries and research community and international development organizations and farmers and business people to make the resilient food systems and they have to take action to transform these food systems. Again, I'm saying the food system, it, it is not limited only with the production. It is beyond the production. The contribution to climate change, it, it is not only with the crop cultivation or animal cultivation. It is beyond that. It also inclusive of all supply chain. So the civil society, and they have to think about the action from the government and the private sector. And countries, they have to prioritize food systems transformation in the next set of NDCs. And this one is nationally determined contributions. Being the member of Paris Agreement, all countries, they have committed to reduce the climate change. They have committed to, to take actions for climate change. So in that case, all those countries, they have committed to reduce the temperature below two degrees Celsius before the end of this century. So in that case, they have committed and for every five years, they have a meeting and they have to uh, uh, um, report and they have to discuss what are their nationally determined contributions? So the countries, they also have the re responsibilities and they could encourage public private partnerships and research communities. The problem with the research communities, of course, we always work in silos. So it has to break and we have to create ecosystem for innovation. Innovation is the key for mitigating and adapting climate change issues. Then international development organizations and reorient goals of development institutions and farmers, they are in a different line fighting against all these odds and challenges, which I just explained. Then businesses, of course, the units, and they also have a role. So everyone have a responsibility and we have to play our part to fixing the food systems as well as to develop the climate change adaptation and mitigation practices as a whole to develop the resilient food systems. So this again, to accomplish the sustainable development goals, we see there are 17 sustainable development goals. And as I told you yesterday, all of these sustainable development goals, either directly or indirectly, they have connectivity with agriculture and food security and food safety. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, and clean water and sanitation, because we have to make sure that we use a lot of fertilizers and pesticides. It can affect the water. And also the responsible consumption and production, then climate action, life below water, life on land, and partnerships. So most of these sustainable development goals, they have direct or indirect link with agriculture, food production, food safety issues. So with that, I summarize the presentation of today. Climate change facts, we have seen whether the climate change is real or not. The data, does it support 
the existence of the climate change. We have seen the observations. Then impacts of climate change on agriculture and food security. How the temperature increase, it affects different dimensions or different agricultural activities. Then elevated CO2 levels, rise in sea level and hurricanes, the extreme weather events. Then also we have seen the impact of agriculture and food, uh, food security on climate change and how we could balance that use of adaptation strategies with the different activities at the research institution level, as well as at the policy level or at the action level, I mean, the at the, at the national level, like adaptation strategies and mitigation strategies, starting from the production to the consumption. Then the way forward is policy and everyone has to understand that each one has a role to play and the coordination and it is the responsibility for all of us to ensure the resilient food systems. With this gain, I acknowledge the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, then IPCC reports and IF um, International Food Policy Research Institute, as well as the Climate Change Agriculture and Food Security reports, because I would have used some of the data to present uh, and um, prepare these presentations. So with this, once again, I thank you all for your kind uh, patience as well as hearing and for having given me this wonderful opportunity. I thank everyone. Thanks very much. And it's over to you, uh, Dr. Raja. And uh, I hope now is the time for uh, questions and discussion session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, thank you very much, Dr. D. Saravana, Professor of Food and Agriculture. And our uh, dear participant, now you have uh, time to ask questions. Even some of you, if you have missed uh, yesterday's uh, presentation, and you can ask this IDP uh, Nahi project, it is meant to for the students and faculties. Uh, keeping in view of raising a lot of problems in culture and the students has to take some of the stuff. For this reason, we have started this uh, webinar series and uh, this is one of the important topic. So how um, our, you know, this uh, future agriculture would be like in, in times of uh, IQ, Hello. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing you. <laughs> sorry, sir. I'm not hearing you. Yeah. Yeah, no. Can you hear me now? Yeah, because Can you um, me? I, I think connectivity is, connectivity is poor. Connectivity, my connectivity is a little bit uh, uh, unstable. And uh, so, dear participant, he has nicely summarized uh, in the view of uh, climate change, uh, this agriculture, as to see this, he has addressed the problem of. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yeah, just the problem in activity. Okay. So, yeah, there was a problem in connectivity. Um, okay. So, he has uh, nicely addressed all these uh, issues, like uh, starting with the quality of. Uh, like uh, starting with the quality of. Oh, yeah. 
uh, suddenly the quality of water uh, when climate changes, uh, you know, the salinity or acidity level will change, and also dead water. You know how the you know recent technology like yeah, yeah, the technology used to deliver the water. You know, in some places there is this water and since this you know falls short water. So what is important in I'm sorry, there was a sorry, problem. problem. So, so nicely presented all this. I presented all this. I presented all this. Hello. Uh, okay. Uh, so when you see, uh, see just sit on the chat box, I think there was a little bit of a network maturity problem. Uh, so here are uh, uh, questions. Yes, sir, please. Just a minute. Yeah. Uh, Uh, so from sustainable manner meet climate change in view of agriculture. So sorry, can you please repeat the question? Yeah, it is there in the chat box. Uh, Ten twenty, they have uh, person Aditya Pratap Singh has typed the question. Uh, could this have from any sustainable micro environment manipulation? For mitigation of climate change in view of agriculture. Okay, so are you asking about the controlled uh, uh, cultivation of crops? Hello. Okay, for for instance, right? Let me tell you. Suppose if you wanted to yeah, grow the controlled cultivation of crops in glass houses or greenhouses, right? So in such instances, what you could do is uh, you will be generating the emission of Can you unmute? There was a problem. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, this is a new normal, but <laughs> I'm sorry about it. Just I was explaining. Okay, let me just explain to that uh, question, right? And what happened here? Uh, when you use this micro environments like the controlled uh, environment conditions like uh, greenhouse or glass houses to cultivate the crops. Then again, you are controlling the temperature and the relative humidity and other factors. So for that, you may need energy. Uh, so in that way, uh, 
uh, you are again contributing to the uh, climate change. But what you could do is you could use the solar radiation or to build that greenhouse or build that structure, you could use the renewable energy sources like the solar radiation. You can lay that photovolt, uh, the solar radiation and to run the pump as well as you could use that energy to control uh, the um, temperature and relative humidity and to run the irrigation uh, so that you are actually balancing that. So in that way, you could use the sustainable practices to mitigate the climate change. Right? Yeah. One more um, question. Uh, Okay, I'm seeing another uh, question here, right? Uh, from the perspective of small landholders who do open field cultivation, like how does mixed cropping, etc., could possibly help combating the climate change? Do you all hear me? Yes, yes. Sir. Okay, thank you. So I will, I will, I will respond to that question, right? So when you do the open field cultivation and you asked about the mixed cropping, right? So then again, while you are going for this mixed cropping, then you have to know the companion crops. When you have this companion crops, um, so that. Uh, for, for instance, if you have the pulses with non-legumes, then naturally the soil is enriched with the fix fixation of atmospheric nitrogen. So that is a kind of sustainable practice so that you could reduce the application of nitrogenous fertilizers. Because the application of the fertilizers, then again, it leads to the emission of greenhouse gases. Then again, it contributes to the climate change. So when you're doing this mixed cropping with the companion crops, as well as the nutrient rich crops, the soil health management can reduce the contribution of uh, um, um, gas emissions to the uh, climate change. That is one thing. And also the other thing is when you have this mixed cropping solutions, I mean mixed cropping uh, practices. And here again, you could think of there are some crops in case of organic agriculture, that's what they follow. And they use those crops as the repellents to keep the insects and diseases away from that field. So in such cases, if you have that crops uh, with, with, uh, uh, in a combination, and if you're going for this mixed cropping systems, then again, the application of the pesticides that are again reduced. So in such, such instances, then again, you are doing the sustainable practice. So by this way, you can, uh, it has to be decided by the case by case. So that is why the location specific uh, practices, sustainable practices have to be developed. So in such instances, definitely the mixed cropping and it can be facilitated through sustainable practices to reduce the climate change impacts as well as to reduce its contribution to the climate change. Right, thank you. In the chat box, uh, uh, there are a lot of questions. Can you see them and answer? Yeah, I see this question. What are the other strategies? What, sorry, what are the strategies can we adapt for conservation of the genetic resources in the era of climate change? Right? So, if you see, the international organizations, they have the germplasm or they have the uh, gene bank uh, by which they conserve 
uh, uh, these gem blossoms. And some of them, they have uh, the uh, gem blossom collections uh, based on uh, the seeds. The seeds uh, have been collected from different sources uh, and they have uh, the collection as well as they have the gene bank and using that uh, gene bank or uh, the germ plasm bank, they can conserve these genetic resources and it can be made available to the uh, states or it can be made available to the national level or it can be made available across the borders for the persons who wanted to try in their locations and see how best it, it helped to uh, combat and uh, the climate change as well as adapt to the changes or uh, the impacts of the climate change. Right? Thank you. Are you hearing me? Because I'm not sure. Yeah, we are hearing. Okay, thank you. I see a question from Rajendra Yadav. Scientists have high confidence that global temperatures will continue to rise for decades to come, largely due to greenhouse gas produces by, produced by human activities. Um, IPCC, which includes more than 1,300 scientists. Um, sorry. What is that? from the United States and other countries forecast their temperature rise to 2.5 to 10 degree Fahrenheit over the next century. According to IPCC, the extent of climate change effects on individual regions will vary over time and with the ability of different societal and environmental systems to mitigate or adapt to change. The IPCC predicts that increase in global mean temperature less than 1.8 1 to 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit above 1990 levels will produce beneficial impacts in some regions and harmful ones in others. Net annual costs will increase over time as global temperatures. The question is, seems to be very big. I'm trying to read the whole thing, but it's a difficult here in the system. I don't know. Let me just, okay. But I'm not seeing the question here. I see some uh, text in chat box. I don't know um, the participant would like to add or uh, ask any uh, specific question. Sorry, I'm not seeing any question from Rajendra Yadav. Sorry, Roshan Pancholi. Just I'm seeing a yeah, paragraph that is pasted in this chat box, but I'm not seeing any question from Roshan. I'm sorry about that. You can directly ask the question now. And you could, if you want the question, be unmute yourself and direct that. Okay? So this is a Can you hear me, all the pen? All the participants can hear me, can unmute yourself, can ask Hello? Hello? Yes, please. Uh, my question, yeah. myself, BP uh, from Odisha, my question is, uh, how the C3 and C4 plant types are affected under the climate change situation? Okay, sir. Thanks for this question. 
And here, if you see uh, the C4 plants, right? And um, uh, mostly, you know, the, the, these plants, it, it have some impact on uh, the photosynthesis or photosynthetic efficiency. Uh, as I told you, the CO2 levels, it have uh, the impact on crop growth. But at the same time, it, it may have some negative impacts on it. But um, uh, with respect to C3 and C4 plants, um, the C4 plants, it may have some more resilience when compared to the uh, C3 plants. Uh, um, uh, but with, with respect to uh, the impacts, of uh, climate changes uh, like the temperature and it will have the same effect on both these uh, crops. Okay, sir, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Actually, yeah, IPCC, they have the fifth assessment report and um, um, it, it, uh, most of them deals with the crop uh, production aspects, but um, um, still uh, um, the sixth assessment report, which is due in 2022, uh, the committee is working on that. And probably once that report uh, is out and still we will have a lot of information about uh, uh, the climate change and its impacts on uh, the agriculture as well as on uh, the other industries as well. बाबा जगत था बाबा हमारे से I see someone, you know, is just talking. Participants, can you please mute your mic unless you wanted to ask any question? Hello, sir. Namaskar. Sir, my question Hello. is uh, how yes, we please. can reduce how we can reduce the temperature by agriculture global temperature. If you want to reduce the global temperature, so why the agriculture? How we can control? Okay, as I told you that uh, the uh, increase in temperature because of the emission of greenhouse gases as well as the uh, contribution to uh, uh, the uh, uh, climate change, right? So that's what I say that we have to reduce the emission of uh, greenhouse gases, which is the main contributor to increase in temperature as well as uh, the increase in uh, uh, sea surface temperature. So in that case, we have to carry out all these uh, sustainable practices to reduce the greenhouse gases, which will ultimately uh, will have impact as well as a reduction in the global temperature. So that's not just uh, uh, action uh, for tomorrow or day after tomorrow. It is uh, the sustainable for uh, next uh, 100 years or 50 years. Uh, so it is a sustainable action. That's why the topic itself, you know, we have it as the chronic climate change. When we say chronic climate change uh, is occurring every year. Every day, so that's how it uh, goes on. Right? Thank you. One question, sir. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Sir, where are you from? Okay, I'm from uh, the University of the West Indies. Yeah. Oh, sir. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, very long distance. We are from Jaipur. Okay, great. Hi. Oh, Sir. Uh, which university you uh, teach?
Yeah. Sir, very nice way of uh, explanation, and we are understanding uh, surely, so presently. Thank you so much, sir, for this session. Thank you. You are welcome. राजेंद्र जी यू कैन आज क्वेश्चन Don't talk about this. You can ask only question. Hello, sir. Hi, sir. I am the Shamrain from the Academy of University Bhopal, Hi. and uh, I am the student of the BC on the agriculture in the second year. And uh, I want to ask one question that, uh, sir, uh, what should I do right now to create a sustainable? environment to create uh, better agriculture okay so the sustainable practice right it uh, starts from uh, day one right from starting from planting till you harvest the crop right uh, that's what the whole presentation is about and i'm sure that the presentation will be available in youtube right and i don't know have you been uh, from the start of my presentation or just join now yes sir so actually due to some uh, uh, technical issue i am joined right now sir okay kindly go to the youtube video and definitely that uh, uh, video will be available in uh, youtube so you could just view it uh, it has a lot of uh, information uh, in 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 those slides and still if you have any concerns and questions you can always shoot an email i will respond to your email thank you yes sir thank you sir um dr raja sir there is then if there is no question i think we can continue uh, for to the planning progress topic food production equity and then climate change can you all so sorry i'm not hearing you properly <laughs> probably it is the internet connection i see one question will climate change make this pandemic worse okay this uh, pandemic is uh, have uh, is having lot of uh, acute efforts right um on food at the same time as i told you yesterday already the climate change and the other uh, problems they are causing a harm on uh, food security because we have seen that uh, 135 billion people they um, are under risk for uh, starvation as well as they may uh, go without food but uh, this covid 19 this has again um, uh, compounded the issue and because of that it is predicted that 265 million people uh, they may be at risk so uh, this uh, climate change and uh, the other uh, problems like pests and diseases or the uh, conflicts among the uh, states uh, like in afghanistan or in uh, some other uh, uh, countries uh, the political instability all those problems are already there in agriculture and this covid 19 or this uh, pandemic it has also added into those issues and definitely all these things will make the worse uh and they will pose a serious problem for the uh, food security yeah
I see question from Richard Mistra. And the question is the food diet change thing that you mentioned, is it economically viable? Because it will hamper the person who are associated with the livestock farming. Of course, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question because we have to think about uh, um, all possibilities. Um, uh, once the persons are reducing uh, the uptake of diet, uh, from meat or from the livestock, and if they are moving to the plant-based uh, diets, then definitely it will hamper the livestock farming. So while we are uh, making some decisions, we have to see that there, there is a balance uh, with all these things. It, it is not suggested that we have to completely reduce the uptake of meat or as well as uh, to reduce uh, the livestock based meats or uh, the animal based meats but at the same time there should be a balance uh, so that uh, if you have seen that there, there are uh, diets and there are countries where the persons are having more of meat um, in, in graph I would have uh, showed that um, sorry in the in, the, in, the, in those map uh, uh, on dairy consumption as well as on the meat consumption if you have seen uh, some uh, part of the uh, world they consuming more than uh, 100 kgs per person so it's actually is high and also sometimes it is posing a health threat uh, uh, to the persons as well so that's why in uh, countries like colombia they just started some moments and they're saying that uh, make less monday so it, it, it should have a balanced act it is not saying that you have to completely come out of it so there should be a balanced protein diet and uh, it has to be balanced as well it's a very good question thanks very much for that question okay if it's not uh, thank you delivering this lecture. And today you have a uh, very nice way that, uh, you know, due to this uh, climate change, uh, there is the important thing how this, uh, you know, like uh, um, the water and the production is important. Like as you said rightly, uh, that, uh, you know, water is a precious one. Uh, due to climate change, in some areas there is a fall short of water and there is in some place, you know, excess water. And uh, yeah. and in some places, and you can see that uh, even uh, climate change or the temperature uh, that uh, affects the crop production, like uh, pollination and you know um, and fertilization, and it's all affects. And also, you talked about more on uh, sea uh, foods as well as uh, you know animal foods. Um, so and then finally, you have talked about this uh, uh, stress pest and disease and the stress on the plants due to this climate change, the minor pest becoming major and the minor diseases are becoming major. And so it is, uh, uh, you know, continuous uh, things which are changing and, you know, production are greatly affecting due to this climate change. Even over a period of time, you know, 10 years, uh, there are minor pests minor pest and diseases becoming, uh, you know, problematic uh, even in India uh, that is supposing major threat to its uh, production. And also stressed. So when there is no water, plants also stressed much. And uh, you know you have nicely uh, pictured about all these uh, topic, and you have covered. And our students and faculties and researcher were benefited. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Now I'll uh, uh, give time uh, to our SRF. Uh, she will be proposing this uh, vote of thanks. And uh, with this, uh, we will finish it. And thank you very much, sir for joining and before uh, leaving, uh, giving to this formal vote of thanks, I want to inform to all the participants that uh, today I have sent the attendance list, attendance link uh, in the chat box and uh, please do that, it is there. And further, uh, tomorrow, uh, 10 o'clock, the link will be open, okay, 10 a.m. The quiz link will be open. Uh, the participant, you can attempt the quiz tomorrow 10 a.m. in the morning and you will receive the first 100 you will receive the certificate and other people you will be receiving the certificate within two working days. So I'll give uh, time to our SRF uh, for the proposing this vote of thanks. 
Yeah. Before that, thanks very much, uh, Raja sir, as well as uh, uh, your dean and uh, the nodal officer, as well as ma'am who uh, was uh, there yesterday. Um, so thanks uh, very much, everyone, um, the students um, and all participants. Really, I very much appreciate this opportunity. Uh, stay safe. Um, once again, thanks very much. Yeah, just some. Uh, very uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure for this particular webinar. Uh, I thank our patron, um, Professor M. Premji Singh sir and Dr. S. Basanta Singh sir for their constant support. I would also like to thank our nodal officer um, and Dean, you know, Professor B. N. Hazarika sir uh, uh, for his encouragement and for all of his efforts in um, making this program a successful one. I would also like to thank our associate nodal officer, Dr. P. Raja sir, uh, for his all of his efforts. And um, it's our special thanks to our resource person. Uh, thank you, sir, um, uh, for your time uh, and uh, sharing your valuable knowledge with all of us. Uh, finally, I would like to thank all the participants for contributing your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Th thank you all the participants. Okay, bye-bye. Okay,